Lab 9 is called Molar Mass of a Volatile Liquid, and that's exactly what you're going to do. So we're still developing that cure for cancer, imagine it. And uh, this time, though, your cure is a uh, liquid, and you need to figure out its molecular weight. How would you do it? Well, maybe you would do it this way. Do keep in mind, just going back to uh, the lecture here, that when we're doing experiment 3, that's in the lab, obviously. Uh, we are going to talk about molecular weight, even though uh, we really mean molar mass. But it doesn't matter if it's an ionic compound, and it doesn't matter that we really mean mass when we say weight. Okay? Do pay attention to the units of that quantity, grams per mole. If you find grams and moles independently, just like we did in lab 3, then we can have a molar mass. So there we go. It's the same as Lab 3, revisited, this time with a liquid, and this time using a different method to determine the number of moles. That method is called the Dumas method, and by carefully volatilizing, vaporizing a liquid, they don't even necessarily have to boil it, just vaporize the liquid, and measuring its volume. If we then can condense it back down and get its mass, we can figure out number of moles of compound and the mass of the compound, and we have the two pieces of our equation. So, this lab involves gas laws, which hopefully you have gotten to in lecture by now, but if not, then this will be your introduction. You'll have to trust me that the pressure of a volume of a gas times the volume of that gas will equal the number of moles of that gas times R, which is a gas constant, times the temperature of that gas in Kelvin. This always works. It's a law. So we can rearrange that equation and have number of moles is equal to PV over RT. If we measure P, if we measure V, if we measure T of the gas and R is a constant, we will have then determined the number of moles of gas. And if we can determine the mass of that sample, which is challenging for a gas, but we're going to have a liquid that we will volatilized to a gas and then condense back down to a liquid. If we can weigh that liquid, you got it. We have figured out our number of grams and our number of moles independently and can calculate grams per mole. So there's a lot of equations on here. And uh, that's uh, because there are multiple approaches. The way your lab manual does it is by correcting to standard molar volume. Uh, I much prefer just measuring P and V and T and determining number of moles directly. This is the method that's in your book, where if you measure pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature at one set of conditions, that will be equal to a constant later pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature, because PV over NT equals R, a constant. So PV over NT at any set of conditions will equal PV over NT at a different set of conditions. Uh, since our number of moles isn't changing, then uh, N1 and N2 would be the same and they would cancel. So this is the equation 2 out of your lab manual, that PV over T equals PV over T. At standard temperature and pressure, we have values for pressure and temperature. 0 degrees Celsius, 273 Kelvin, and uh, uh, 1 atmosphere. At STP, standard molar volume is 22.414 liters. No matter what the gas is, one mole of that gas at 1 atmosphere and 0 degrees Celsius will take up 22.4 liters. So 2 grams of hydrogen, H2, will take up 22.4 liters at STP. 32 grams of oxygen, O2, will take up 22.4 liters at STP, and so on and so forth. So we can use equation 2 to find the volume, correct it to uh, standard conditions, and then uh, compare that to standard molar volume. That's the book's method. right? So we would have our volume uh, at standard temperature and pressure conditions be equal to all of these quantities and then we can use that volume uh, the standard volume of our gas uh, in effectively a ratio with the fact that one mole would take up 22.4 liters to get our number of moles of gas in our particular sample. I do not care which method you use. To me the method I had on the other slide makes more sense. We just measure uh, pressure, temperature, and volume and poof we have number of moles. Uh, correcting it to standard uh, conditions and then comparing it to standard molar volume also gives you the number of moles. Either way will work. It just depends which one you want to do. Uh, I call PV equals NRT, uh, fill in the blank, 
and then I call this method initial conditions, final conditions, because you're measuring one set of conditions and then correcting it to a standard set of conditions. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Uh, find which one makes more sense to you, and you will use that mat method. In either case, you're finding number of moles of sample, which you will then plug into grams, which you'll weigh independently, uh, per mole, and that gives you your molecular weight. So some things to consider practically. Uh, as soon as you get into the lab, start heating your water bath so that way you don't have to wait for water to heat. Water absorbs a lot of heat. It takes a while to heat a, flat, uh, a beaker of water uh, up. That's why we use water in firefighting because it absorbs a lot of energy and therefore can uh, put, <laughs> put the fire out. Um, the lab manual suggests that you correct the standard uh, temperature and pressure conditions. You can do that. Um, it's not the only way. Uh, so your lab instructor may have you alter your data sheet slightly so that you don't have to correct a standard molar volume. You just uh, solve directly from uh, the, the conditions that you measure. Um, but you do need to understand why the method that you choose works. Are you going to use the lab method? Then understand the initial conditions, final conditions, correcting to standard molar volume method. If you're going to use uh, the method I suggest, just plug fill in the blank, PV equals NRT and solving for N, then understand why that works. Okay, be able to explain either method because you're going to have to explain it in your lab report. So some other practical things. Um, again, I'm just suggesting that you use my method and not the, the lab manual's method. And so this would be how you would adapt your data sheet. Um, lines 1 through 6 on page 79 are unchanged, but you must correct pressure to atmospheres. You must correct volume to liters. Uh, in order to use this value of R, which is the value of R. Um, the lab manual's method doesn't use R, uh, so you don't have to correct for anything. You don't have to change your, your pressure uh, measurements or your volume measurements because you're going to start with milliliters, you'll end with milliliters. You'll start with millimeters of mercury, you end with millimeters of mercury. You'd be dividing both sides by 760 to correct it to atmospheres, so it would cancel. Um, but to use just the plug-in method, uh, you can omit line 7. Line 8 will be not uh, what is written there, but it will be moles of, the, of your sample uh, by solving PV over RT, uh, which would be line 5 times line 6 divided by R and uh, line 4, also in the denominator. Then line 9 would be directly your molecular weight. Line number 3, the mass of your sample, uh, divided by line number 8. Or do it both ways. See which one you actually end up liking. Okay. So other things to consider uh, practically, uh, make sure that your Florence flask, the, the, the flask that is you know, round but slightly flat on the bottom, is as deep into the water as possible. So clamp it all the way up near the top, uh, have the beaker filled with the water, not that it's, so that it's going to overflow, but so that it gets up all the way almost to the top when you have your Florence flask submitted. Um, determining when all of your liquid that's in the Florence flask has evaporated is the challenge of this lab, to be honest, practically speaking. Um, it can help if you just grab a hold of the ring stand and literally jiggle it so that the, the liquid in the bottom of your Florence flask is moving around. As soon as you see all of the liquid gone, and as long as you don't see any up here, which can be challenging because there's a clamp around it, right, looking from this, this side so that you can see, um, as long as there's no visible liquid in the Florence flask, you're good to go. Take it out immediately because you must remove the Florence flask exactly when all the liquid has evaporated, not before and not after because you're filling the Florence flask with vapor. That's the volume of vapor that you want. And then you're going to take it out and let it condense back down. And then you're going to weigh that drop of liquid that recondenses. You want that. If you leave it in too long, you're going to vaporize all your sample, and then you're going to heat the sample beyond it just vaporizing and filling the flask. When you heat a sample, it expands. And so the amount that is going to exactly fill this flask, once you start heating it beyond when it's just filled the flask, it's going to expand and come out the top of the flask. You don't want that either. You need holes in the flask so that excess can escape, but again, you want to remove it when it's exactly vaporized. That is the real challenge of this lab. You've got a bunch of liquid here in the bottom, and it's vaporizing, it's vaporizing, it's vaporizing, it's vaporizing, it's vaporizing, and it's escaping out the top. You want it when it's all vaporized and it's just no more liquid left, then that means that the flask is completely filled with your volatile liquid sample. If you take it out too soon, there will be liquid, and it will also be filled with vapor. 
And then when you weigh it, you're going to be weighing not just the volume of vapor that recondensed, you're going to be weighing the vapor that recondensed and the liquid that was left that you never vaporized in the first place. So that your mass of your liquid, your G in your grams per mole, is going to be way too big. And that's going to impact your molecular weight. I leave it to you to determine how. If you overheat it, then you've vaporized all your sample and you've expanded your sample and extra has come out that shouldn't have come out. So then when you take it, the flask out and recondense it, there's going to be too little that recondensed because it will have expanded beyond the vapor, you know, the volume of the flask. And so your G will be too small. Think what impact that will have on your experiment. Also keep in mind that you will have weighed the flask and the aluminum cap empty, no liquid in it, before you started. So if it gets water on this aluminum cap, either before you weighed it empty, empty, or as you've done the experiment, if water from the water bath has gotten you know, condensed onto your aluminum cap, again, that's going to change the mass of your volatilized and recondensed liquid sample. At the end of the experiment, there should be a drop of liquid left in there that recondensed from the vapor that filled the flask. Remember, water boils, right? And it turns into gas. And then gas can condense back down to liquid water. You're doing the same thing with your volatile sample. It has to vaporize to gas, exactly fill the flask, and then you're cooling the flask and condensing it back down. If you have anything extra here, or on the flask for that matter, it's going to make your grams number be too high. If you've expanded it beyond the flask, the extra has escaped out the top, then when you recondense it, it's going to not represent the amount that fills the flask, and it's going to have an impact on your experiment. So your grams this week is the one that can really, really, really get messed up. You're measuring the volume of the flask, you're measuring the temperature of the water, which will be the temperature of the vapor also. You're measuring the atmospheric pressure pressing down on the flask, which will be the same as the pressure of the gas pressing up out uh, of the flask. Uh, so PV and T, you, know, they, you really can't go wrong with those. So that means your number of moles can't really go wrong. R is a constant. So number of moles this experiment is not where your error lies. It's all in that G that you're measuring, the number of grams that you're measuring. It can be too big or too small, and again, that's going to have an impact on your molecular weight, and you need to explain that in your lab report. So, that's what I question you on here. Think about what will happen to your molecular weight if you don't heat the sample long enough so that it fully vaporizes. What will the effect be on your molecular weight if you heat it too long and you continue to expand that vapor beyond the barrier of, or the volume of your flask? What will be the effect if you had water on the aluminum cap after you heated it, but not before? or before but not after, right? That's a great one because that will affect your results either way you want it to. So no matter what your error is, you can explain it. Do keep in mind that mistakes are not a valid source of error. And certainly adding too much liquid at the beginning is definitely not a source of error, okay? Because you should have just vaporized it all until there was no liquid there, okay? Adding too much at the beginning is almost never a reason for your error in your uh, final answer. So think about uh, after the lab, uh, why your error is the way that it is, and make sure that you can explain it in your report. That's all for this one. We'll see you in the next pre-lab.